At 15 years old, my foot was amputated. And I went from being a high-level athlete, playing against some of the best footballers in the whole country, to being bedridden for nine months. I had over nine surgeries, 10 plus blood transfusions, countless minor procedures, and a lot of narcotics. For months, I watched as my foot turned black and necrotic, as I wrestled with the fact that I'd never play the sport that I loved ever again, and I'd be a disabled person now. But something interesting occurred in my mind at the time, something that would radically change the way I perceived the reality forever. See, as I laid there in the intensive care unit of this hospital with three to four IV drips in each arm, giving me the perfect concoction to keep me alive, I was defecating in a metal tray, peeing out of a catheter. Nurses were wiping my bum for me because I couldn't do it myself. Truly a miserable scene. There was a big window to the right of me. And all you could see in that window was a big, beautiful tree. And that tree became my daily solace. Every day I would look as its golden rays would hit its leaves, the way they would sway in the wind, the clear blue skies behind it. That tree became a living metaphor for the enduring beauty of life. The enduring beauty which I took for granted every single day before my accident. And then and there, I made a promise to myself that when I got out of the hospital, in whatever capacity, I would never take consciousness for granted ever again. And I began to think, I'm gonna lose my foot, but I'm gonna have my other foot. I'm gonna have my two hands, my eyes, my ability to taste. I'm gonna have a loving and supporting family. I'm gonna have a roof over my head, access to clean water. And see, this wasn't a matter of seeing my cup as half full or half empty. It was realizing that my cup still overflowed. And we can always choose to perceive our situations this way. But you must learn to control your consciousness. You must learn to control your mind. And that is what I hope to explore in this video, is to hopefully synthesize eight years of personal development into a single video, into five simple principles that you can follow to live a more peaceful, serene, and directed life where you know you'll be able to attain whatever mission you're working towards, but without the stress and anxiety that is put on you by your want to climb the social hierarchy ladder, making more money or attracting a, high, a higher quality partner. Ow. <laughs> so hope I hope this video serves you and let's get into the five principles. But how can I write about falling in love with consciousness without first defining it? So buckle up. Consciousness is everything. Okay. And I don't care if you believe in a material paradigm and you believe that everything can simply be reduced down to atoms and molecules all the way down to quarks and that's all there is to it. Or if you believe in God and you believe that he is the creator and it all comes from him or her or a source. Regardless, everything comes from source, a base material, right? from the billions of cells that make up the intricate systems of the human body, from the tons of metal that make up the Burj Khalifa to the mines that were able to construct it, the engineers, all the way to the generational trauma that leads a man to beat his wife. Everything is consciousness, all figments of consciousness made of the same raw material. I want you to do this exercise with me. 
Take a deep breath into your belly. Hold it for a few seconds. And then exhale slowly. Now I want you to look around. You could be on the bus. You could be in your room, in your kitchen, eating cereal. And regardless of where you are, what you're doing, I want you to appreciate the depth of complexity and the depth of beauty that is all around you. Understanding that everything is consciousness, that everything is made from this source. Think about the intricate details down to a microscopic level in everything. The mechanical system that makes up the pulley that is going to hold up a window cleaner on a thousand foot skyscraper. The colors and design of a font on a buzz advertisement to the beautiful artistry and soul behind a beautiful piece of music, a painting, a piece of poetry, a YouTube video, an article, a scientific discovery. Maybe it's a software that you love using. Think about the hours of work and ingenuity and creativity that went into building that. From the mundane to the magnificent, there is beauty all around you. And the second that you become disconnected from this sense of bewilderment and awe at the world around you, that is when suffering sets in. So you can never lose sight of that. You must at all time stay grounded and present and aware of all of this beautiful, complex source energy, source material that is around you. Because from there is when you can begin to understand the rest of these principles and create art, create businesses, lead your relationships from a beautiful, peaceful, harmonious place. And I want you to do this exercise every day. Give yourself that gift. If you don't do this, you're not living. You're merely surviving. You're letting life become a mechanical series of events, tasks, duties, emotional flurries. You're going to school because you don't want your parents to yell at you. You're trying to study and become smart because being smart is highly valued in society and you don't want to be outcasted. You work out because you don't want to be fat and you want to attract a mate rather than discovering the beauty and strength of what your body is capable of. You go to work not out of feeling of passion and purpose and mission that is greater than you or pursuing the flow state, but rather because you need a paycheck and you got to pay your bills and maybe you want to upgrade your car or move into a nicer apartment. See, as soon as we get disconnected from this sense of bewilderment, of the pure marvel that is consciousness, that is this creation that we're living in, life just becomes a mechanical series of events and stories and emotions and tasks and duties. And you stop living. You stop being in love with consciousness, being in love with your life. So just remember that Living life is a gift. It's something to experience, something to savor. Whenever you have to do something, change I have to for I get to. You are exploring consciousness. You are exploring reality. Sometimes things get heavy. Things get difficult. You're running around, playing a sport, you fall on your shoulder and fracture your collarbone. But we only suffer when we attach the heaviness of life to our expectation of what life should be. Why is heavy bad? Why is difficult bad? You can handle it. You've done it before. The proof of that is that you're here right now watching this video. Chapter 2. Reframing Joy
one of the harsh realities of beginning to do any sort of personal development work, any sort of spiritual work, is this sense of once you see it, you can't unsee it. This sense of guilt that we feel whenever we don't stick to the new habits that we've set out for yourself, whenever we're unable to follow through with the behaviors that we know are ideal. And we then begin to judge ourselves. We begin to despise ourselves to some extent for not reading the book or not eating the healthy meal or drinking or going to bed too late, not doing the outreach for your business, whatever it may be. And it becomes extremely challenging because you don't find pleasure in the things that you know you should be doing yet. But you also feel a sense of guilt and shame when you do the things that you used to find pleasurable. And in a sense, I think this can be perfectly illustrated by the Dunning-Kruger effect. And I'll put a graph of one screen because I think this illustrates it perfectly. In the beginning, you start reading the self-help books. You start watching the inspirational YouTube videos, the motivational podcast. You start hitting the gym for the first time. You do your first meditation session. You land your first client in your business. You get a girl's number, whatever it may be. And it feels amazing. You get a quick taste of progress, a quick taste of what success will feel like. But then reality sets in pretty quickly. And you start realizing how difficult this kind of work really is. Saying no to the donuts when your coworkers bring them in from work. It's pretty difficult going to the bar or the club or a social gathering and staying sober, getting to bed every single day at 10 p.m. Yeah, that's difficult. Reading the challenging book on finance, microeconomics, history, psychology, that is dense and difficult to get through. Yeah, it's pretty boring. It's difficult. Hitting the gym, lifting the heavy ass weight, running the miles, eating the same foods over and over again, doing the cold outreach, doing the sales call, filming the video, having the difficult conversation with an employee, with your partner, with your parents. This kind of work is challenging. It's difficult. And you realize that pretty early on. It's far more enjoyable to order a pizza, to buy the newest console, and quick scope 12 year olds on Call of Duty. Of course, that's more enjoyable. It's far more enjoyable to go on the lad's holiday, right? And get plastered drunk and try to sleep with as many women as possible. That's a lot more enjoyable than going on the 10 day solo meditation retreat with nothing but a journal, maybe some books, and just working through some of the stuff that's in your head. Man, that's difficult. Right? But see, what you have to do, and what you have to realize, is that it won't change doing the good habits, reading the book, lifting the weights, having the difficult conversations, getting up at the same time. That's not going to change. That's not like that's ever going to feel the same as having the sugary treat, drinking the alcohol, doing the drugs, having the sex. What you have to do is retrain your mental palate. You have to fully rewire your dopamine hijacked brain that associates these things with joy. And you have to begin to associate joy with a deeper, more spiritual sense of fulfillment. And that is the fulfillment of pursuing your mission of doing the things that you know you need to do. The fulfillment that comes from aligning every thought, every behavior, every action, every belief, 
in accordance to your highest vision, your highest mission, which is to express love, serve others through the expression of your own unique gift, whether that's in the capacity of an artist, of a business person, a salesman, a teacher. Doesn't matter what you do. Reframing joy is the second step. It's understanding that it is difficult and that it's okay. But you have to retrain your mind. And the way you do that, or the way I know how to do that, is through crafting a vision. It all starts with a vision. A clear image of who you will become. Not want to become. Who you will become. And down to the gory, minute details. I want you to think about are you working on your life's purpose every day? How do you carry yourself in your work? Are you energetic, passionate, present? Are you a leader, an artist, a business owner, a loving father or mother? What kind of relationships do you have with your parents? Do you have mastery in a specific domain? How do you dress? How do you smell? Does love flow in your relationships? Do you want to rip your partner's clothes off 20 years into your marriage? Where do you go on holiday? How is your health? Are you running marathons? Are you shopping at Whole Foods and doing clean and jerks? How many books have you read? Have you created your magnum opus yet? Are you working on it? You need to grab a pen and paper and write it all down in detail. Daydream, make it vivid. Add images, help add a soundtrack if you need to. But this vision needs to become so deeply ingrained within your subconscious mind that the desire to eat the sugary treat, the desire to go out and get drunk, the desire to procrastinate and not do the work that you need to do, creates so much cognitive dissonance between what you know you need to do to achieve your vision and that cheap desire of the flesh that you don't do it and you begin to reject it and you begin to find joy in that rejection, you begin to find joy in choosing the carrot juice instead of the fizzy Coke, even though objectively the Coke tastes better, but the celery juice is a manifestation of you taking a vote for the kind of person that you want to become, right? It's a great quote from James Clear. Every action you take is a vote for the kind of person you wish to be. That's what we're talking about here. But in order to retrain your mental palate, you must have a clear vision of what you're trying to attain. And then every action, every thought, every behavior is in alignment with that vision. And I'll give you a tangible example to make this personal. For a little over a year, I've stopped dating of all types, no relationships, no nothing right i've really just tried to focus on my own personal development and i'm human so that's difficult i want connection you know love is great but sometimes when i'm here at home on a saturday morning or sunday morning and i'm trying to read a really difficult book right like a the archetypes by carl jung or a book by Richard Feynman, or Nicholas Nassim Taleb, right? Or I'm trying to read the Bible. These difficult, dense texts that take, you know, 20 minutes just to understand one sentence that make you feel stupid. These are not fun to read. I would much rather be taking a girl out on a date on the weekend having a Netflix and chill, you know, having a cuddle. Objectively, that sounds a lot better. That sounds a lot more fun. But the reason I'm able to have the discipline to stay at home and read those books is because I have a vision. I have a vision of a 40-year-old version of myself who's read 500, 1,000 books and can clearly articulate the ideas between them all, can make connections, can synthesize it's the kind of person that has 
gathered so much wisdom from taking action in the world and learned from so many great different mentors that I'll be able to establish a code of values from which to lead a business, lead my household. And that vision of that man that is speaking at events, writing, synthesizing ideas, leading a household has a strong values. That vision turns me on a whole lot more than thinking about Netflix and chilling. You see how this works? It's delayed gratification. Chapter three is taking on a perspective of seriousness towards life. Now, let me just clarify here that I don't mean that you can't have fun. I don't mean that you need to be this super serious person, Terminator-like person that doesn't smile, that doesn't go out with their friends, and it's just at home grinding. That's not what I'm talking about. You should have fun. You should have relationships. You should go out with your friends and have a drink every once in a while. What I'm trying to say is that life isn't a joke. Life is serious. It's the most serious thing there can be. It's all there is to our knowledge. When I think about all of the bad things that happen to good people, all of the social injustice that's going on in the world, wars, famines, people sleeping outside, I, I can't help but think, why me? Why am I okay? Why am I living this life of privilege? Why do I get the opportunities that I get, but others never get the chance? And immediately upon following that train of thought, what comes up next is an immense feeling of duty. A feeling of duty towards those who don't have the same opportunities as me and as you. A duty to demand the best of myself in every single area of my life in order to serve to the fullest capacity. That is why life is serious. You only get one shot at this. Think about all of the blessings and opportunities and things that you've been given that we tend to take for granted. I believe we're here for a reason, and I believe we have a duty to demand the best of ourselves, to seek to express our own unique gift, our own unique creativity in a way that serves others. If you've been put in a position to have the tools to be watching this kind of content on the internet, to have access to the resources to change your situation and change the situation of others, your family perhaps, then I believe it is your duty to do so. So yeah, have fun, have some drinks, have a laugh with your friends. But don't forget about the vision. Don't forget about your mission. Don't forget about your duty. Chapter four, the art of conscious curation. The information that we allow into our awareness and how we choose to act upon it dictates the quality of our lives. Ninety-five percent of our behavior is unconscious. Ninety-five percent. Books, movies, music, YouTube videos, articles, conversations that you have with your friends, your self-talk. All of this is content, structured information. And if you haven't noticed yet, all of your ideas are downstream from what you consume. All of your actions are downstream from what you consume. 
So in an age where we are drowning in information, but starving for wisdom, the most important skill that you can develop is to become a master of your inputs, is to consciously curate the information that goes into your mind because you recognize the second and third order consequences that follow. And again, this is not just internet content like a little YouTube video that I'm making or a book or a movie. It's your conversations. It's your self-dialogue. The music that you listen to. And you need to be ruthless. Like, you need to be so ruthless with this. Because it's all that you have. If you don't protect the information that goes into your mind and make a conscious decision to curate it and align it towards your vision that we discussed earlier, no one's going to do that for you. If you don't program yourself, you will be programmed by your parents, by the media, by your friends, by companies. You need to become an active creator of your reality in that sense. And I do really mean reality because when you choose to curate your inputs and work with your subconscious mind, which is, this is what I'm talking about, this is mental alchemy. When you choose to do this kind of work, you change your beliefs, you change your thoughts, your thoughts lead to your actions, your actions lead to your results, your results lead to feedback, which then comes back around and reinforces those beliefs. And whatever pattern occurs, say a negative result occurs or a negative action occurs, you can choose via conscious curation of your internal dialogue, your self-talk, to reframe that failure as a lesson, as an adventure on your journey. You have control. The biggest illusion we're told or that we're sold is that we don't have control, is that things outside of us have control. And then we give everything and everyone more power than they really have. You have control over your mind. You have control over your attention. You have control over how you react to situations. No one can take that away from you. So master this. The art of conscious curation. Garbage in is garbage out. If you want a beautiful quality of life with great relationships, with financial wealth, with physical health, it starts with what you feed into your mind. YouTube videos, Netflix shows, self-talk, conversations, friends, all of it. You must audit every single area of your life, every input, and align it to your vision. It sounds simple in practice, but this is going to take daily repetition for years and years and years, probably the rest of your life. I don't know. I haven't lived that much life. <laughs> and lastly, it's understanding pendulums. Now, I've made a whole other video on this. It's called The Ancient Philosophy Behind Effortless Success. So I recommend you watch that if you want to understand the bigger picture of what I'm talking about here, because it's a pretty nuanced and detailed topic. But to make it simple and give you a taste of what that is here, it goes back to Sir Isaac Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Okay, We are discussing the natural ebbs and flows of life, the pendulum. Because it's going to swing regardless. Things are going to happen to you regardless. And it goes back to what I just said in the last point. It is up to you to understand this natural flow of life and to learn how to navigate it rather than get swept away by its currents. I hope this video serves you. And if you've watched this far and you're not subscribed, you should probably subscribe because I think you might get a lot of value from the rest of my videos. Take care of yourself.
take action, some of these things. Peace.